Thank you for that. Whenever I guests speak, especially for the first time, I like to warn people a little bit. So again, my name is Leela Sinha and I live and work in Portland, Oregon. Um, I have a preaching style that's a little bit spoken word, a little bit beat poetry. So the words tend to come faster and um, more like that stream we were just listening to. You can let the words roll over you. The ones that you need will sink in and the ones that you don't will just wash away and that's fine. So the title of this is From Each According to Their Pleasure. A number of years ago, I read a series of stories on the internet set in a true gift economy that was almost a utopia. And that was deliberate, that utopia quality. It set the right stage for what was to come. But for the first time in my life, I understood the difference between a gift economy and a barter economy. In short, it was this. In a barter economy, interactions are transactional. I do this so that you'll do that. In a gift economy, each person contributes according to what gives them pleasure. And the only repayment as such is seeing other people using it or enjoying what you've put in or simply the satisfaction of having done the thing, whatever the thing is. Now, in most societies, there is a need for most people to put something in most of the time so that society can, society can persist. But there is no direct exchange expectation. In a gift economy, there is no, I do this, so you will do that. There's only, it gives me pleasure to do this thing, so I do it for me, for us, for the world, for fun. There's giving and there's receiving, and they are both gifts. Now, let me say that again because it really revolutionized my thinking. There's giving and there is receiving, and they are both gifts. In a gift economy, the idea is that your needs are met by someone else's desires. In order to receive pleasure, then you have to know what your own desire is, and you have to offer it loudly and clearly enough, because without survival needs tugging at your skirts, you need to know what you want. You need to know what makes you sing, what makes you cry. You need to know how you feel the impulse and the desire deep inside you before you even have words for it, before you even know what it is. You have to have the level of self-acceptance that makes space for that desire to root and bloom. Or do you? Maybe you just need to give yourself permission to do the thing that rises up, that wants to be done, that harms not but we're humans. We're so messy. How can we possibly know each other and ourselves that well? And especially, especially here. What if we wanted to do that right here and now and not wait for that perfect utopian planet? What if what we have right now is a fairly perfect utopian planet? And what if what we want is to invite that planet as a whole and as a composite of billions of individuals, people and plants and bugs and birds and wind and air and sky and earth and rocks and trees to participate in this gift economy? Or what if, in fact, we have been the ones being invited all along? What if they are all effectively people and we just got here? What if the earth gives when it pleases her and we receive when it pleases us and we give when it pleases us and she receives when it pleases her? What if we're already doing it? If we want to keep finding our ways to the places where giving pleases us and the places where receiving pleases us, if we want to know that when we don't have pleasure, not even a shred of a thin transparency of an overlay of a ghost of pleasure, then something is off. It's not quite working. <laughs> If we want that kind of deep relationship with pleasure, we have to be able to and willing to go deeper into ourselves and find what's true and bring it out and make it visible, even if it feels awkward. We have to find the grains of sand that hurt and bring them out or allow ourselves to be transformed. Sometimes what we're doing is making a pearl and sometimes it's just infected. <laughs> But in order to understand what's happening inside ourselves, we have to know ourselves. We have to assess the state of the thing that is ourselves. In coaching, we have an expression, you can't read the label from inside the jar, which is why even a coach needs a coach, even a therapist needs a therapist. When you are inside it, it looks different. Ministers need ministers too. We have to tend each other. 
but also inside it, we have more access to everything than anybody who is not inside it. We have immediate energetic biochemical access. We have immediate interoceptive access, the access of feeling that breath go into our bodies easily or with difficulty and coming out of our bodies easily or with difficulty. I think there's a reason meditation so often starts with breath. You can feel the air down to a certain point. Everyone's certain point is a little different. And usually you can't and do not wish to feel the air actually inside your lungs. But it's a start to notice that the air is actually going all the way inside your lungs. To notice in any moment, in this moment, just for a moment, especially if it's difficult or hard or uncomfortable to notice, where are the places inside you that hurt to notice? Where are the places inside you that yearn and what do they yearn for? To notice if your mouth is dry, if your tongue is trying to tell you something about water, if your muscles are singing songs of stillness or movement or pain or thirst. Noticing your desire is the key to knowing pleasure, to knowing what would please you in this moment, what would bring you pleasure in this moment, not what all the advertising or the people around you or the echo of your mother's voice tells you is pleasure, but what would please you in this very moment and how does that connect to the world around you? It may be that what would please us is extremely commonplace and acceptable and easy to get and fine with everyone around you. Or it may be that what would please you is something you've been told all your life you should not want. Or something in the middle, neither extreme, neither completely easy, nor completely lifelong challenge. But there are patterns. Most of us have a pattern. For most of us, our desires are either usually acceptable or usually not. And that pattern, knowing what that pattern is and understanding that pattern is a key, a key to pleasure. When I was a kid, I read books like they were my lifeline, probably because they were my lifeline. Anne of Green Gables, Little House on the Prairie, Pippi Longstocking, The Fabulous Five. Many of them have since emerged as terribly problematic in one way or the other, but they cut deep grooves in my thinking and in the thinking of other people who were reading alongside me. In Little House, for example, we have two sisters, Mary and Laura. For Mary, it's always easy to be good somehow. She likes doing handwork and sitting in chairs and being moderate of voice and temperament. And somehow I wished I could be like her because she was the right kind of girl. And Laura does not like any of those things, but she's constantly trying. <laughs> She's constantly trying, struggling to fit into the mold of goodness, of womanhood, of society. I didn't want to get in trouble like Laura did, but I didn't think being as good as Mary was ever going to be in my grasp. We see the same pattern in Joe in Little Women. We see it in Anne of Green Gables and her friend Diana, and then the twins, Davy and Dora in The Next Generation. Either it's easy for you or it's not. And we're taught over and over again that even though these are the main characters usually, and they're the main characters because they're interesting, they are flawed for their intensity, for their desire, for their movement, for their enthusiasm, for their nonconformity. Some of us have always found the requirements of our world fairly reasonable, fairly easy, have not struggled to sit quietly, have not struggled to study, have not struggled to do the things the way the world told us, told us to do them had no impulse to run away and do something wild and different, did not yearn for things off the island, in the ocean, outside the Shire. <laughs> and some of us did. So you may be a Mary, or you may be a Laura, an Anne or a Diana, a Davy or a Dora. You may be a Frodo, or you may be Samwise Gamgee, along for duty and love every step of the way, saying, I don't think this is a good idea, Mr. Frodo. <laughs> Samwise is there for loyalty. Frodo is there for adventure and because he can do nothing else, which brings us to the paradox. Because if those intense people were boys or men, they did usually sometimes get to be heroes when heroes were needed. If they were women or girls, not so often. Usually they eventually got married and grew up and settled down. But even if they did get to be heroes, eventually they come home and they're expected to be quiet. Even the men are expected to conform, expected to fall into line. And the problem with that is we intensives are not linear in 2014 i injured my back i had what's called an idiopathic rupture of my l3 l4 disc which is idiopathic is just a fancy medical way for saying we have no idea why that happened and rupture is exactly what it sounds like the disc that separates my l3 and l4 vertebrae burst and all the cushioning jelly that's supposed to keep them from rubbing against each other squirted out i was left with very unhappy nerves and about six months of 
absolute convalescence to resolve it. So I had a lot of time to think. In fact, I probably had too much time to think. And I was thinking about all the successes in my life. And then I was thinking about all the failures in my life and the struggles that I've had in various places. And I started to think about all this stuff that I was just talking about, about how some of us fit the mold and some of us don't. And some of us get to do what we're called to do. And a lot of us don't. And how we feel like heroes, often without a quest. And I was thinking about the, and what I was thinking about was the fact that I was always too much, too emotional, too excited with dreams that nobody else could conceive of. Michael and me, like this, I, that rocket, right? And to which I clung like they were a life raft because the rest of life simply didn't seem worthwhile the way it was. And it didn't make sense not to dream of something better. The only things that made sense to me were trees and dirt and magic and occasionally, and occasionally another person who dreamed like I did. And as I lay there thinking and thinking and thinking, I started to write about what I was thinking and post it on the internet because what else do you do with that much thinking? And recently, one of those posts floated back up into my Facebook memories, and it reads like this. I am intense. No one has ever said otherwise, not even me. It has saved my ass. It has given me adventures. It has opened doors long forgotten and painted shut. Intensity in its various forms has made my world rich and broad and deep and interesting and fun and well-informed and Leatherman useful. Intensity does not preclude quietude. It does not in any way subvert peace or grace or gentleness or exploration. But when you need the fire hose, the head down and keep goingness, you've got it. When you need raw truth, it's there. When you need fierce love, deep roots, crisis management, they are ready to hand. And afterwards, afterwards, the fire burns to embers in the quiet night. I tend to attract the same kinds of people into my life. Does this sound familiar? Well, it did indeed sound familiar to people, and those posts became essays, but they also became concepts and scaffoldings and the framework that Mariah mentioned. First, it was the intensives. That's me and Laura and Anne of Green Gables and Joe March and Frodo. Maybe that's you. And then I began describing the shadow that they threw, because if these people exist, then the other kind of people must also exist. And so I called them expansives, Mary, Diana, Dora, sweet, kind, compliant, comforted and shored up by structure, rather than hemmed in by it, predictable, steady, loyal, like Samwise. Those, those are our expansives. And then a continuum between them, of course, and then a book about it with the framework all laid out that was not prescriptive, but descriptive, not a medical model, not pathologizing, not judging. We've been taught so hard to judge each other, and that hurts all of us. This is just what we're like, both of us, all of us. This is just how we are, and there's nothing wrong with either one. There's nothing wrong, and we're all needed. A year and a half after I started to think about that, I was holding my printed book in my hand, and yeah, that's intensive. <laughs> so why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I believe in us, in Unitarian Universalists. I believe in our ability to do better. I believe that pleasure and justice must coexist, and I believe that that starts at home with seeing what we can do to meet everyone's needs. Some of the very early Christians, very early, believed that we were put here on earth to create heaven. And that when we created heaven on earth, when we did that successfully, then Jesus would come back. I don't know about the second coming, but how can we move towards something that feels more like a heaven where everyone's needs get met? That doesn't seem like it should be a stretch. How can we create that fairly utopian, reasonably, mostly utopian planet right now, how can we start in our congregations made of imperfect people in this imperfect world? How can we do better? If different things please different ones of us, and if pleasure is the guiding force, how can we make our congregations places where we receive as a gift and give as a gift from each according to their pleasure? Now a warning, this pleasure thing does require a certain amount of flexibility because it reveals what actually pleases us instead of what we can be guilt-tripped into. Uh -huh. And it requires true consent. If someone says no, that's a complete sentence. No pressuring them, no wheedling, none. Not like, oh, but couldn't you possibly? No, they said no. Respect that. Then they'll feel free to say yes when they want to say yes. If it pleases no one to create coffee hour, then maybe there will not be coffee. Yeah. Or maybe... <laughs> I've met us. I've been you, you all my life. 
So maybe there will not be coffee or maybe something else pleases them. Maybe else, something else pleases you and that will help the coffee happen. Perhaps it's money, perhaps it's praise, perhaps it's community. But the focus is on the pleasure. What pleases you? What would please you to do? What would please you to give? Quilting bees work because they take something that might be a one of one kind of task and they turn it into something else. The reward for quilting is a quilt, but the reward for a quilting bee is social and community and connection time and getting the quilt done faster. Sometimes if you're an introvert like me, it's maybe better if it's a podcast or an audiobook instead of more people, but the principle is the same. Pleasure and busy hands, both. So I'm going to make this really concrete right now. Think of three tasks in your congregation that might please you to do. Things that you would enjoy doing or things that might lead to something that you would enjoy. That might have as a side benefit something you would enjoy. Where is the seed of your pleasure? Where is the pleasure for you in the doing? Think creatively. Think possibility. But think pleasure. Okay, now think of three things that do not please you, but that serve the congregation. What do the things that please you have in common? What do the things that do not please you have in common? Where's your pleasure in all of this? And consider the possibility that things that please you might not please someone else and vice versa. One could argue that the gift economy I'm describing is actually transactional and it re relies on transactions where the currency is pleasure. If you want to argue it that way, that's fine. But stay with the pleasure. What pleases you? If you strip out all of the media and all of the propaganda and all of the cultural pressures, what pleases you? What gives you that sense of deep satisfaction and joy? Or maybe pleasure to you is excitement and thrill and risk. Are you an intensive, like Laura and Davey and me? Are you an expansive, like Samwise Gamgee, like Diana, and not at all like me? Does it please you to bustle around and maintain routine and make everything precise and easeful? Or does it please you to go out on the edge of the edge of the cliff to the skinny branches of the tree to bounce up and down to sway in the wind and see everything for miles and imagine what it's like to fly? Which one of these is you? There's nothing wrong with either one. We need both. As a culture, as a society, as a people, as congregations, we need both. So which one are you? Once you figure it out, stay true to yourself. Get good at saying no and good at saying yes. And good at knowing when discomfort is necessary and what recover from that discomfort looks like for you. So if hanging out on the skinny branches is your idea of a nightmare, for example, only do it if it's really important. Like, for example, if you want to increase your anti-racism and inclusion skills, even if it's uncomfortable, you might climb out on that skinny branch because that's how you get to the other side. That's how you get the thing you want. Sometimes we have to borrow tactics from the other kind of person in order to get where we're going. Even if you think risk and discomfort are the worst things in the world and you only want to have first and second breakfast and elevensies and put up your feet and make a cozy fire and drink a cup of tea, you can go out on that branch anyway sometimes. And know that when you do those risky things, you're going to need more support. You're going to need to come back home and sit with your feet up and your tea for a while. You're going to need to recover. On the other hand, if you're an intensive, you work with in bursts anyway. You do the thing and then you rest. And then you do a thing and then you rest. There's no steady state for intensives. There's only up and down and up and down and up and down. And risk is probably at least a little bit fun. Let's be real. And we wave to the expansives, right? So the expansives are doing this and we're doing this. And we wave to the expansives who are keeping that middle line steady as we go by up and then down. But don't make yourself, if you're an intensive, do tedious things unless the thing you want is on the other side. So routinely coming to worship, participating in ritual, practice, meditation, spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. That one surprised me, but it turns out spreadsheets do the math for you. <laughs> so only if it serves a greater pleasure. Integrity, completion, a new space, growth. And both are fine. So if you know you're an intensive, if you know that you're like Anne of Green Gables and Laura Ingalls, if you know you're like Frodo, if you know you get deeply excited and you like to move fast and rest hard and you're fairly risk tolerant, you like novelty, you feel things deeply, you go like hell for a while and then you got to rest deeply. You'll get into a project, you'll give everything to it and then you'll withdraw for a bit. So like you work on that capital campaign and then you don't show up at church for four months. 
if that's who you are, then find projects like that to volunteer for. Tell people that's who you are. Tell them it's okay. It's that simple. Set expectations the way they need to be set. Find something that inspires you, that has a bigger meaning, that has a big impact. And pair up with somebody who's not like that. Pair up with somebody who will do that last 20% of the project because you know when the end is in sight and almost everything is done and you're just wrapping up the last few things, that's when you lose interest. You know the study stuff is boring for you. You can see that it could be done. You know how it could be done. You know you can do it. So you're not interested anymore. So pair up with somebody who is. Get help. Get an expansive and work together. And if you're an expansive, if you're a Mary or a Samwise Gamgee, or if you're a Diana, if you're more quiet and more steady, celebrate that quiet steadiness. Find things that bring you that quiet pleasure, that need steady daily attention that you know you can check off your checklist. So satisfying that you can use your ruler to cross out in the notebook. <laughs> Volunteer to send those little notes of connection that keep people so happy. You know, the little ones, they don't say much. They're just like, hey, hi, we noticed that you haven't been around for a while and we love you and we miss you. Not anything deep, not anything complicated, just a couple lines, but you know how it means something to people. Engage people beautifully because that's one of your gifts. Make things orderly. Preset the chancel every time so that it looks beautiful every time. Tend things. Plant gardens. And get an intensive to inspire you, to have big ideas, to drive through the night when it re really matters because you need your eight hours of sleep. To shout from the front of the room. Work together. Don't expect the same things of each other that you expect of yourselves because you're different. And this is the most important part. Each of you tell the other that you love them for who they are, love each other for who you are, not who you wish somebody else would be in that moment. Even if it's frustrating, even if you don't understand how their brain works, that's why they're helpful because you don't understand that way of that brain working because we need that care and precision from the expansives and we need the innovation and wildness from the intensives. We need the steadiness and we need the bursts of energy the world and the congregation and our families, all of us, we need it all. We need everything and we can't do it all. No one of us can bring it all ourselves. We are social. We live in community and there's no valor in being alone. The last set of questions. As you work together, perhaps one of the trickiest set of questions, because here's where you set yourself aside. The question is, who is who you are, who the congregation needs in that task? Where is it that maybe you're doing something new or fun or interesting just because it's new and fun and interesting and that's maybe not where the energy needs to go right now? Or where are you doing something steadily the way we've always done it because it's comforting and ritual and the way we've always done it when it's not quite serving the interests of the congregation right now to do things the way we've always done it? Where can you support? Where can you release? Where can you weave together? Where is the whole greater than the sum of the parts? We need each other. We all need each other. And when each of us gives according to our pleasure, then the pleasure is in being together. Blessed be.